Today I'm going to talk about how green these Tesla cars actually are. Now, they certainly cost a lot of green. A Model 3 with a long range battery starts at $49,000. But the real question is how green are they ecologically? That is a much more complex question to answer and it depends on many things. What is your idea of green? And where do you live? If you live in Norway, for example, almost all of its energy, 98% of the energy in Norway, come from renewable sources. And actually, you know that I'm usually laughing on renewable sources. For Norway, that is actually true, because almost all of its energy is coming from hydroelectric power plants. Not many countries are so lucky to have so many mountains and so many rivers so they can create dams and really create their energy from renewable sources. So if you live in Norway and you use an electric vehicle, you really are not polluting the environment. It's an electric car, so it doesn't burn gasoline, but on a Model 3 long range, you're talking about 500 kilo lithium ion battery and you have to charge it and electricity doesn't grow on trees. So again, it depends where you live. If you live in a country where most of your electricity comes from coal, well, then it's not so green. In the United States, for example, over 60% of the energy production come from fossil fuels. So 40.3% come from natural gas and 19.3% come from coal. Now we also have 19.7% that comes from nuclear but nuclear is a very green source of energy. Just a short break. If you like the video, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helped the channel grow. I put a lot of effort into producing these videos. So if you are a fan of the channel, also share it on your social media. The, I can't do it without the fans helping me out. Thank you so much. Now let's talk about the battery. In a Model 3 long range, you have a 500 kilo lithium ion battery. And unlike the normal lead acid batteries in our gasoline cars, which are 99% of them are being recycled, the lithium ion batteries are too expensive to recycle and there is no recycling process for them. So you know what they do? When these batteries die, like any other thing, they sh put them on a ship and ship them to Africa so they can be dumped there. And then when the rain comes, the heavy metals pollute the ground and then actual people and animals die because the underground water is become, becoming uh, undrinkable. Um, so we are trying to save some CO2 from going into the atmosphere, which we are not going to get into the debate if that is even a serious problem or not. I believe it's not, but that's not the case in this video. But that is, you know, polluting the groundwater and killing actual people and animals, it's a much more, uh, a much worse outcome. Adding insult to injury, the procedure to extract lithium ion from the ground is a very polluting process. You need to mine it and to mine it you need excavators and wheel loaders and trucks. All of these run on fuel. They still don't run them on solar panels. So this is all a big sham. And what is even the lifetime of those lithium ion batteries? You know gasoline cars, you can have a 20 year old gasoline car, it's still running strong. Do you need to change these batteries after six years? Not only that it's extremely expensive, it's extremely polluting because again, you need to produce these lithium ion batteries after six years instead of just having a car running for 20 or 30 years if it's just maintained right. Not only that, to produce one metric ton of lithium, you need to pollute 500,000 gallons of water. So basically you are exporting your pollution to other countries. And if your goal is to protect the entire earth, you know, the, na the nature, then you're not really doing a really good job. Now, some mines in more advanced countries are very ecological to the environment. So they will send this water to some kind of a chemical process where they clean them. But in some countries in Africa where they mine it, maybe the process is not so green. Maybe they don't clean the water uh, uh, truly. So this is not a very green uh, thing as it sound, these electric cars. Now, you know, the funny thing is that Tesla makes most of its money selling carbon credits, not from selling cars, 
And that is very easy to understand because when you sell a car, you have a very small margin on how much it costs you to produce it and move it to, uh, you know, to your uh, dealership and all the other costs involved around it and how much you are actually getting for it. So the margin on cars is not very big, but on carbon credits, that's pure 100% profit that goes into their pocket. Basically, the government tells, you know, companies that sell cars, if you produce environmentally friendly cars, which is basically these electric vehicles, you will get carbon credits from us. And then if you also produce gasoline cars, you can use those carbon credits to get some kind of a tax return on them. So it's, uh, you know, you, you pay less, less in taxes, you get more profits. Now, since Tesla produce 100% electric cars, they are getting a lot of carbon credits. And since they don't produce gasoline cars, they can't use them. So they can sell them to other manufacturers that don't produce enough electric vehicles to get carbon credits for the rest of their gasoline vehicles. And Tesla make most of, the, of its profits from selling those credits. In Q2 2020, they made almost $450 million just in one quarter in a year. So now you know where most of their profits come from. The really funny part is that Tesla gets from the government carbon credits for producing an electric car, which is mar much more polluting to produce than a gasoline car. And then they can take those credits and sell them to gasoline car producers so they can make a gasoline car, which is much less <laughs> polluting to produce than the electric car. The government is so stupid and let me show you why only the free market can solve such issues. The government wants us to all to drive, you know, these cars that are more ecologically friendly and they want you to get a better gas mileage. So, you know, you pollute less. So they force, for example, car makers that make diesel cars, as you know, diesel is a very good engine for trucks and it's a uh, very good on a fuel economy, but it's more polluting. So the government forced the makers to make the engine more complex so it pollutes less the environment. But since the engine, you know, diesels be used to be much more reliable than benzene engines because they're much more simple. But since the government forced these makers to put all sorts of technology on their vehicle so it pollutes less, the engine become unreliable. And since the engine become unreliable, it fails more often. It need more fixes, it need more parts more often. To produce these parts, you need to pollute. You need to ship it overseas and you know it costs money so all of these billions and billions of waste that uh, is created and also pollution that is created because the government is trying to forcibly force the market to uh, create less pollution so we are actually creating more pollution by using the government to try and create less polluting cars another example is since the government's tax cars according to how fuel efficient they are so if you buy a car that is uh, burning less fuel, your annual tax will be lower. So car manufacturers are trying to create, you know, the best possible uh, fuel efficient cars for the laboratory. <laughs> so they can, you know, so on the paper, it's written that they can drive really long and use really not so much fuel. But because of that, car manufacturer opt to create those four cylinder turbo engines. Those engines in laboratory get really good fuel economy. Or if you buy them and drive always like, you know, like an old grandma, super, super slow, you will get great fuel economy because the turbo never kicks in and you basically run on a very small, weak engine uh, uh, where the turbo never kicks in. So that's why you don't waste a lot of fuel. But if you drive them hard, those smaller turbo engines are much uh, less fuel efficient than just running a bigger six or eight cylinder engine. And especially if you need to tow something, if you have a tur smaller turbo engine, you will get a much worse gas mileage than if you just had a bigger naturally aspirated engine. Now, on top of that, these smaller turbo engines, if you run them hard, since they run on much higher compression because you know the turbo is pushing all this air into the engine, they are much less reliable and they break more often. And then again, you need to produce more parts, which is causing more pollution and also, you know, cost you money to replace parts in your engine that is failing for no reason. I mean, we wouldn't produce these engines or we produce much less type of these engine engines if we just the government was not, 
you know, messing with the free market. Other problems we are going to have with electric cars are from the practical side. There is just not enough electricity. Electricity production in the US is pretty much maxed out and there is not extra electricity available to charge up millions and millions of cars. Look at California in the summer. There is not even enough electricity just to run your air conditioning. You want to start running millions of cars from electricity. And even if so, if you want to run all these electric cars, we need to build much, much more electric power stations. And not only that, if everyone runs electric cars, everyone needs to have a home charging for their cars. Otherwise, how are you going to charge it, you know, to the next morning when you need it? I mean, uh, imagine if everyone had to go to electric gas, you know, electric stations to charge your cars. There would be huge lines every morning. That's not practical. So the only way is if everyone has a home charger. Now, if everyone has a home charger, the electric lines in your street, they're not meant to handle this kind of power. If everyone had a home charger, these electric lines would melt from the amount of, uh, um, you know, voltage that would run through them. They would, they would just melt. So not only that you don't have enough electricity, your infrastructure is not uh, strong enough to handle this kind of uh, this kind of cars uh, charging all at once. So that is another something that would have to be would have to you know change the entire electric uh, grid in the US if you want to really have a high percentage of cars running on electricity. You are not going to have millions and millions of cars charging up on electricity that doesn't exist or infrastructure that can't handle that kind of power. Lastly, I want to talk about the Tesla stock. If you look from late 2019, right now it 15x. In uh, less than two years, it went 15 times in price. And if you look on the peak, when it was $880, that's almost 19 times from late 2019, when it was trading for less than 50 bucks. <laughs> so that is a gigantic bubble. It is right now the most valuable car company in the world when they produce when you know they produce a fraction of the amount of cars that uh, you know for example Toyota makes and um, I mean it's just ridiculous so uh, th I, I predict this is my prediction I don't have a time limit on it uh, but I predict that the Tesla stock will collapse uh, eventually either it happens on its own or it will happen together with the market and uh, that stock in my eyes can crash more than 90 percent maybe even 95 percent which in that case it might actually be cheap because you know the stock market usually overshoots to both directions so things are getting usually bubbly and way overvalued and then they get uh, even cheap so when they go down they sometimes people just hate the stock oh i lost all my money on it i just gonna sell it and people will just sell it for when it actually becomes cheap and maybe you should buy it at that point. Um, so that is my prediction. It's a gigantic bubble. It will take down with it, you know, uh, people like Katie Woods. And that's it for today. I will see you on the next video.